This episode could be triggering for sensitive listeners and contains mature content. It may not be suitable to all listeners. Should you need any emotional assistance, please see the show notes for telephone numbers that you can call. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are my own and do not reflect the official policy or position of the podcast. Any content provided by contributors, such as the host, guests, bloggers, sponsors, or authors, are of their opinion and are not intended to malign any religion, group, club, organization, company, individual, or anyone or anything. There is a lot of debate over how a cult is defined. There is even a lot of debate over the use of the word cult, some arguing that the word itself has a negative connotation. Some scholars are leaning more toward calling these groups new religious movements, but not all of these groups are necessarily a religion, so they're also referring to them as high control groups. Regardless of what you prefer to call it, I was pondering what happens when we find aspects of cult-like behaviours within a family unit, where one of the family members displays all of the aspects of a narcissistic cult leader and rules over his household like a cult leader. What do we call it then? This is Decoding Cults, and I'm your host, Palsy. You are listening to Papa Pilgrim, Part 1. This week, we will be kicking off with a lesser-known group. Some call it a cult, others are unsure. As I stated in my introduction episode to this podcast, I'll be covering famous cults, lesser-known cults, and groups with cult-like tendencies. I think this one may fall in the latter. In this episode, we'll be delving into the early life of the leader. Sol Bailey Hale, more commonly known as I.B., was born on 9 September 1916. I.B. attended Woodbro Wilson High School in Dallas in Texas, and by the time he started studying at the Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, he was a hulk of a young man, standing 1.87 meters or 6 feet 2 inches tall and weighing around 112 kilograms or 250 pounds. I.B. was held as an incredibly talented American football player and was a two-time All-American tackle. According to AspireAtlantic.com, the term All-American was first coined in 1889 by Casper Whitney and Walter Camp. These two men wrote for a magazine called The Week's Sport and they wanted to recognize excellence and they wanted to recognize excellent college athletes. Since then, the All-American team has been a recognition given to top-performing U.S. athletes in the collegiate and secondary school in a specific sport over the past season. This award was originally meant for American football players, but has since crossed over to various other sports. In 1939, when I.B. finished his studies, he was drafted to the Washington Redskins, They are now known as the Washington Commanders. Ivy, however, had a deep need to become a public servant, so he joined the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or FBI, instead. It was during this time that Ivy met and married Virginia Kinsbury. Virginia came from a very wealthy family and was described as having beautiful features, but was slightly fragile. Ivy was known as being very dedicated to his job and was praised for being a very hard worker. This had caught the eye of none other than John Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover was instrumental in founding the FBI and was the director from its inception in 1935 until his death in 1972. That is a staggering 37 years. 
The FBI was originally started on 26 July 1908 by Teddy Roosevelt. They were started to combat corruption within the government. And by the time J. Edgar Hoover started, the range of federal interests in crime had grown. J. Edgar Hoover is a very controversial figure, but we will not be getting into that in this story. It's just important to note the relationship between I.B. and J. Edgar Hoover, because this will come into play a bit later. I.B. and Virginia welcomed their first child, well, in this case children, identical twin boys, on 7 April 1941. Robert Allen Hale, known as Bobby, was born first, and his brother, William, known as Billy, was born seven minutes later. A few years later, they brought two more sons into the world, Timothy and Thomas. Bobby Hale will be our actual focus point over the next few episodes, as this story is about him and his victims. But you know how I love to find out the background of a person to bring more context to a story. While I.B. climbed the ranks of the FBI, oftentimes having to work far away from home for long periods of time, Virginia had her hands full with Bobby and Billy. Once, as young boys, they were caught swimming in a mud hole at night and were brought back home by the police. Another time, they were playing David and Goliath, and when Bobby aimed a slingshot at Billy's head, he hit him square on the forehead. Billy collapsed, but was luckily okay. I'm just going to insert a warning here that I will briefly be talking about bullying. So, if this is in any way triggering to you, please skip over the next 10 seconds or so. When a neighborhood bully taunted the children in the area, taking away the local kids' toys, the twins decided to take him on. They determined that Billy would die for the bully's ankles and that Bobby would go for his upper torso. This worked, and according to Bobby, they pummeled him into submission. The young man eventually begged for mercy and did not bother them again. The twins were now treated as little heroes by their friends. Unfortunately, this is also where Bobby realized that he could use his fists to get his way. I.B. left the FBI in 1951 to take on the role of security chief at the local General Dynamics plant. According to GD.com, General Dynamics is a global aerospace and defense company. From Gulfstream business jets and combat vehicles to nuclear-powered submarines and communication systems, people around the world depend on our products and services for their safety and security. The Texas plant where I.B. worked manufactured fighter jets for the company. I.B. was well loved in his community, not only because he was still revered for his previous achievements in American football, but also for his attention and generosity towards charities. His home life was in stark contrast to this. He was rarely home, and he preferred to spend his time at the local country club when he wasn't working. At some point, he started having an affair with Virginia's best friend. I guess Bobby found out about it, because it is said that he started to resent his father for having to keep a secret from his mother. Virginia must have found out about it later as well, because the couple eventually got divorced, and Ivy married the other woman. In the mid-1950s, The twins had started high school at Arlington Heights High School in Fort Worth, Texas. This high school was attended by the children of very affluent people, including Texan politicians. Bobby started training as a boxer in this time as well. They also used their father's football fame to get them out of some sticky situations, like avoiding getting tickets for driving too fast. Tensions in the home were rife between father and sons. My guess is this was due to Bobby's lashing out because of having to keep his father's secret. And all of the other trouble that the twins tended to get into, which Ivy would need to smooth over using his substantial influence within the community. The parents decided to send them to an Episcopal prep school in Tennessee, which is like a Christian boarding school. The Episcopal church is based in the U.S., 
is a member of the Anglican Communion and is a mainline Protestant denomination. They are headed up by a bishop, but do not claim apostolic succession. The twins would, however, return to Arlington Heights a year later. When Bobby was 17 and in his matric, or as they call it in the US, senior year at high school, he started taking a liking to 15-year-old Kathleen Connolly. Kathleen was affectionately known as KK to those closest to her. KK was the daughter of John Connolly, who was a well-known attorney at the time. Some interesting facts about John Connolly are that he was elected for governor for Texas in 1962 and would go on to serve for three terms in this position. Just as an aside, a term is four years. John was also sitting in the car near then President John F. Kennedy on 22 November 1963 when he was assassinated, and John Connolly was also seriously wounded during the shooting. Another interesting fact is that the accused shooter, Lee Harvey Oswald, had attended Arlington Heights High School for a short time and was said to be just one year ahead of the twins. Bobby was not super into school. He preferred to hang out with his friends and drive around in his Ford Thunderbird. KK, on the other hand, was very academically driven and her family was extremely proud of her. KK started helping Bobby with his homework, and soon the two fell as madly in love as only two teenagers can. It kind of reminds me of Sandy and Danny from the movie Grease. As the pair grew closer, it seemed to KK's family that she was drifting further away from them, almost as if Bobby was driving a wedge between KK and her family. Here we can start to see a glimpse of Bobby's need to keep someone isolated from others which is something that he would go on to do later, and something that cult leaders tend to do as well. Another interesting thing I read was that one of KK's friends, Patty Doris, started dating Bobby's twin brother, Billy. Being teenagers, I can just imagine that their hormones were all over the place, and shortly after her 16th birthday, KK realized that she was pregnant. Keke was scared to death about her situation. Her family were very prominent and well-respected within the community, and, it being 1959, she didn't have the option to go and have an abortion. It was illegal. I had a look on reproductiverights.org, and it seems that it is still illegal in the state of Texas. KK's teachers noticed that she was unwell, and once, when KK had gotten ill in one of her classes, the teacher contacted her parents and told them that she suspected that it may have been morning sickness. The Connellys confronted the couple with this information, but they denied it. Keke was distraught, so Bobby suggested that they run away together, get married and start a new life away from the gossip hounds. Keke wasn't very keen on the idea at first, but Bobby was very persuasive and he convinced her that it was the only way. One day, when John Connolly flew to Washington, D.C., the pair jumped into the car and drove 160 kilometers or 100 miles over to the next state, which was Oklahoma. The reason why they chose this state was because at that time, a girl of 16 could get married there without parental consent. So on 16 March 1959, Bobby and KK got married by an Episcopal minister. From there... They drove all the way to Tallahassee in the state of Florida. A friend of Bobby's had arranged for him to get a job with Lone Star Boat Company in Tallahassee, where he was paid $70 a week. Now, that would be just under $170 or a staggering 13,000 rand in today's terms. The pair moved into a second-story flat at 223 West St. Augustine Street. It seems like things were not all sunshine and roses from the start. Not long after the couple arrived in Florida, KK called her father in tears. We need to keep in mind that KK was 16 years old, pregnant, and 1,400 kilometers or 870 miles away from her family. She was probably scared, 
unsure about her future, worried about raising a child with no support from her family, and had hormones going all over the place. The couple's fathers, John and Ivy, immediately jumped into the car and made the 13-hour drive down to Florida. The dads told the couple that they were not angry at them and that they must please come home with them and they would work things out once they're back there. I suspect that KK must have been torn between wanting to go home and sticking it out with her new husband. But sadly, in the end, she decided to stay in Florida. Despite her decision to stay and showing loyalty to her husband, things did not get any better for KK. The couple argued constantly, and just one month into their marriage, KK had run away twice. The first time, she checked into a hotel in Georgia for a few days. The next time, she hid away in their landlady Ethel Hawes' flat. Ethel had passed a letter on to Bobby from KK, where she explained that she felt as if he didn't love her anymore. I want to state here that the only version of events we have for the following day are those of Bobby Hale, so please take this from where it came. Additionally, I am going to insert a trigger warning here. I will be speaking about suicide, so if this is in any way triggering to you, please skip over the next minute or so. According to Bobby, on the 28th of April 1959, he went downstairs to Ethel's flat to try and convince KK to come home, but she refused. He then left to run some errands and returned home around noon. He stated that when he entered the flat, he found KK sitting on the couch with a 20 gauge shotgun in her lap. I'm going to give the same trigger warning here as this next bit will be hard to listen to. Bobby said that as he entered, he saw KK awkwardly raise the shotgun to the side of her head. He bent down and pleaded with her not to do it and to give the shotgun to him. Bobby then lunged for the gun in an attempt to get it away from her, but it was too late. A shot rang out and blasted her just behind the left ear. He then cradled her slumped body in his arms and tearfully exclaimed, Oh KK, what have you done? A few of the neighbours heard the gunshot and alerted the authorities. An ambulance came out, but sadly, KK had succumbed to her injuries on the way to hospital, and the baby which she was carrying had not survived either. KK was just 16, and they had only been married for 44 days. Bobby was taken into custody, and an inquest was opened into the incident. Virginia supported her son through the inquest and would attempt to shield their faces from the media whenever she accompanied him when he went for questioning. Bobby did finally take the stand, and it was reported that he had given his version of events very calmly and showed no emotion. Then, when the jury had deliberated for just 45 minutes, they came back with a ruling that the death was accidental. Bobby returned home to Texas, but he did not go back to Arlington Heights High School. This was because of all of the sideways glances and whispers that he would have to endure when he was back in Fort Worth. Eventually, he enrolled at Polytechnic High School, where he earned his diploma. Later that year, Bobby enrolled at Texas Christian University, the very university where his father had studied and was still famous for his achievements in American football. Billy, on the other hand, attended North Texas State University. The two campuses are a 43-minute drive from each other. Billy would later go on to veterinary school and marry his high school sweetheart, Patsy Doris. But I digress. In his first year of university, Bobby and his friend Dick would go out drinking and cause a lot of trouble. It looks to me like Bobby always liked to cause trouble. Anyway, he would also ask out quite a few girls, and on their first date, he'd be all solemn and declare that this was his first date since the death of his young wife. 
This would lower the defenses of the girl he was dating at the time and garner a lot of sympathy for him. When Ivy's mother passed, she left her grandchildren some money and Bobby used his share to buy a brand new blue Chevrolet Corvette. He also acquired a pilot's license. In his second or third year at university, Bobby fell in love again, this time with a young lady called Linda. Not much has been made public about Linda or their relationship. We do know that the couple had a son named Alan and that Linda left him very early on in the relationship. It seems, to me at least, that Bobby didn't have contact with either Linda or their son after this. And if you're keeping count, this is wife number two. On the 7th of August 1962, two FBI agents were stationed outside of the apartment of Judah Campbell Exner and they were keeping an eye on her comings and goings. The agents watched as two young men broke into the apartment through a sliding door on the balcony. The agents then reported the burglary and looked up the registration for the blue Chevrolet Corvette, which the two young men used to get away in. They soon discovered that the car was registered to I.B. Hale, former FBI agent and current security officer for General Dynamics. What is most interesting about this little break-in is that it was thought that Judith was supposed to be known as one of President John F. Kennedy's mistresses. She also claimed to have been the personal career of messages and money between some high-ranking mob members in Chicago and the president to garner votes, although these claims were never proven. Nothing ever happened to these two young burglars who looked an awful lot like the twins and even drove the blue Corvette from the FBI investigation standpoint. My guess is that the relationship between Ivy and J. Edgar Hoover played a part in that. What we do know is shortly after this break-in, a massive $6.5 billion deal for new fighter jets was suddenly not awarded to Boeing, but instead went to General Dynamics. $6.5 billion in 1962 would be worth $64.7 billion today, which is a mind-blowing 1.17 trillion rand. If you've listened to some of my previous episodes, you'll know that the 60s was quite a revolutionary time in America. There were marches against wars and against discrimination, flower power was at an all-time high, excuse the pun, and young people were trying to break free from the rigid bonds that their parents placed upon them and find a less encumbered way of living. This was the time of hippies, free love, and of searching for the meaning in life outside of the normal church. By the late 1960s, Bobby grew his beard out and he grew his hair down to his shoulders. He got rid of all of his possessions, including his previously prized Corvette and acquired a Triumph motorbike and started driving all over the country. Bobby fully embraced the hippie lifestyle, traveling around places like Oregon and California, sleeping on people's couches or in communes, smoking weed and taking LSD. Lysergic acid diethylamide or LSD, also known as acid, is an hallucinogen. On drugs.com, It says that users may experience impaired depth and time perception with distorted perception of the size and shape of objects, movements, color, sound, touch, and their own body image. So, when Elisha writes in her book, Out of the Wilderness, that her father told her a story of being on a commune and all of the trees suddenly bowing down to him, she was pretty sure, and I tend to agree with her, that he was on an acid trip. One of the after effects of acid is called flashbacks. These are basically recurrences of the effects of LSD days or even months after the person uses it. According to drugs.com, prolonged use and high volumes of use can lead to severe psychosis. There have, however, been some studies that have shown that in a controlled medical environment, Microdoses of LSD 
can have therapeutic uses, including helping the treatment of alcoholism. Bobby took an interest in midwifery. Even though he never received any formal training on this, he was soon requested to help deliver babies at the various communes where he resided. I couldn't figure out why he developed this interest, but his skill would become useful to him later in our story. In the summer of 1967, Bobby was traveling to New Orleans with a girl he was seeing when they stopped over in Los Angeles, California. One evening during the stopover, they had dinner with a young man who was quoting scriptures and was surrounded by beautiful young women who were hanging on to his every word, all starry-eyed. I think it's here that Bobby figured out that one man can have power and influence over women and get them to do anything he wants to. That man was none other than Charles Manson. I'll cover the Manson family story in a future episode. On the rare occasions where Bobby found himself in Texas, he would go and visit his parents. One of these visits, Ivy called Bobby into his den. Now, I need you to picture a clean-cut older man, ex-football player and pillar of his community, sitting across from his long-haired hippie son in the late 60s, early 70s. Ivy tore into Bobby about everything that he had done wrong through his entire life. He then went on to tell his son that he was super disappointed in him and said, I don't ever want to see your face again. When Bobby left, that would be the last time he ever saw his father. Ivy would die from a heart attack in 1971 and he was only 55 years old. In 1970, Bobby found himself at Sunny Ridge. According to tedpilger.com, Sunny Ridge was one of many alternative communities that existed in the 1960s and the 1970s. They named it Sunny Ridge because the sun would always shine on the ridge, while there may be rain or fog in other areas around them. It was a very family-friendly place. The commune was in Oregon, and here, Bobby met and started dating a woman called Christine. Christine, or Chris, as everyone called her, had a daughter from a previous relationship named Aaliyah, and her and Bobby had two sons, Micah and Sean. He also discovered Transcendental Meditation, or TM. According to tm.org, the TM technique was founded by Maharashi Manesh Yogi over 50 years ago and has been learned by more than 6 million people. It can only be taught by certified TM teachers in a course carefully personalized for each individual. Bobby even started leading TM sessions at his commune. One of the sessions Bobby attended was with none other than Maharishi Mahesh Yogi himself. According to Bobby, the yogi saw his dedication and was very impressed by his desire to spread the teachings. So the yogi invited him to assist during his lecture tour in Europe. Bobby left Chris and the three kids behind at the commune and went on the European tour. While with this group, he started going by the name Ram. Apparently, this was short for Ramachandra, who was an ancient king who ruled in India from 1271 till 1311. Ramachandra was regarded as an incarnation of Vishnu, and Vishnu is the god of preservation within the Hindi faith. This was the first, but definitely not the last, of Bobby's name changes. After spending a few months with the group, he became disillusioned with the guru and his inner circle. They were apparently more interested in the money than actually helping people. Can we all insert a shock horror here? He left the tour and returned back to Chris and the kids at Sunny Ridge. One morning, while Bobby and Aaliyah were having a bath, Chris apparently walked up to him announced that the relationship was over and that he could keep three-year-old Aaliyah. Then she turned around and left with the two boys, Micah and Sean. Now this gave me a little pause. 
I'm sure that bathing with your child is an innocent thing, but what this guy goes on to do later, it just creeps me out that she was in the bath with him. Next, why on earth would you leave your daughter, your own flesh and blood behind with her stepfather, especially when you choose to take his biological children with you? I'm sure she had her reasons, but I just can't fathom what they would be. On the 7th of March 1973, German astronomer Dr. Lubos Kohotek discovered a comet, which obviously was named after him. We know from a previous episode on Heaven's Gate that once a comet is discovered, many people and cult leaders come forward with the this is a sign for the end of days or some version thereof. Well, there were a few people in the US who were scaring people into believing that the comet would hit some part of Northern America in January of 1974 and they would completely destroy it. Bobby must have heard one of these predictions because he packed up his meager belongings, took Aaliyah and went to South America to hide from this upcoming catastrophe. Accompanying Bobby and Leah was a woman, and I couldn't find her name anywhere, and the only description we have of her is that she had a wooden leg and that they would hide their money in her leg. She also had an unnamed daughter who travelled with them, but I kind of understand why they would like to keep their lives private. Bobby and his companions begged and busted for money to be able to eat and travel. They had apparently made it all the way to the Andes Mountains in Chile. They also met up with a man called Ray, who had previously lived at Sunny Ridge Commune and had been friends with Bobby. During their travels, Bobby still indulged in LSD, and at some point, most likely on one of his hallucinatory trips, he started to believe that he was some kind of prophet. This will become relevant later in the story. In early 1974, Bobby and Aaliyah were deported as their visitors' visas had expired. And in case you were wondering, the comet passed Earth and nothing happened to North America. The two moved around for a bit until they finally settled at a commune just outside of Apple Valley, which is in the Mojave Desert in California. Apple Valley is about a two-hour drive northeast from Los Angeles towards Las Vegas. In our next episode, we will pick up Bobby's story at the Apple Valley Commune. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button and rate and review us. It will go a long way into improving the podcast and helping others find it. Please invite your family and friends to listen too. If you're listening on YouTube, please subscribe and like the video. You can leave comments if you want to. You can find us on Facebook And you can email us at decodingcults at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. If there are any topics around the workings of cults which you would like further explanation on, or if there is a cult that you would like to hear about, email me or post it in the Facebook group. Remember to go and check out By Design Crafts SA and Endeavor AV and tell them that I sent you. The amazing logo art was created by the tattoo artist Jock Jacobs. Thank you so much for listening.